I went to college about 45 minutes outside of Columbus, Ohio, and on a night, a friend of mine got tickets to a hockey game that was happening in Columbus, and she got the tickets, and got a group of us together, and, and she, she was driving us there, and we went to the hockey game, and we had a great time. It was, it was a lot of fun. And then it was time to, to leave the hockey game, and as we, got out of, as we got out of Columbus, we were on the interstate heading back, and all of a sudden, my friend who was driving remarked how she was flying past all the other traffic, and there were, had been some winter storm warnings in the area, but there wasn't a lot of snow, and she just was talking about how inexperienced drivers were driving really slowly and how there was nothing to worry about because there wasn't any snow. And we were just sailing past people, and, and it was a smooth ride back to school. Until 10 minutes later, we hit a patch of ice. And we were in the middle lane at the time, and then the car headed into the left lane, and we were heading south and then north, and the problem was traffic was heading west. Uh, so we were just, we were, we were going sideways. And we could see the headlights for us. And then she overcorrected. So we went from the outer left lane, there were three lanes, over to the right lane, and then hooked back to the left lane. And um, I thought we were going to die. And the car came to a halt in, in a grassy median between the two sides of the interstate. She started hyperventilating, having a panic attack. And... Uh, friend and I, we, we pushed the car up, got her to calm down a little bit, got her to, to breathe normally, and uh, then I volunteered to drive us back to school, and, and, and I did. But that was the, really the first time in my life where I really feared for my life. There's something about seeing the lights of a semi through the side window when you're the first person the semi is going to hit that wakes you up. And all of I think all of us go through life knowing we're mortal, but especially as we grow up, it's in our, it's in our minds, but we really don't deal with loss all that much. Maybe, maybe we, we lose a grandparent. Some people tragically lose a parent, and, and I understand that there are always exceptions, but most people don't deal with incredible loss at that young of an age. What happens when our life flashes before our eyes? What happens when we're in circumstances where we think, oh, this could be it? For most people, that doesn't happen in a moment of emergency. For most people, that happens in a drawn-out process because of advancements in medical technology, where we're given prognosis from a doctor or a medical team. We're staring down surgery or treatment. And all of a sudden, the question that we have to wrestle and grapple with is the question that all who have come before us have had to face. And all who come after us will as well. What do we do in those moments? When we recognize that our lives will come to an end. As we've been going through the early church, and we've really seen events that have spanned over the course of nearly 30 years as we've looked at the book of Acts, Today and next week, we're going to conclude our look at the book of Acts. And today, we're going to see as Paul and others who were with them saw their lives flash before their eyes. And how did they respond? And what did they do? If you have your phones or your tablets, I'd invite you to follow along with us this morning. In the Bible app, it's a free resource that you can find in whatever app store you utilize. Once it's installed on your device, the feature that we use every week here at Lakeside is called events. You can go to the events section and then either enable your locations or write in Lakeside Community Church. Algoma will pop up. You can follow along with us right there on your phone or your tablet. If you have a traditional Bible with you this morning, again, we've been journeying through the fifth book in the New Testament, the book of Acts. We're in Acts chapter 
27 this morning. If you're joining us via the stream, thanks so much for watching. My name's Brian. I'm part of the team here at Lakeside. We're glad that you're joining us. The verses will be available for you on the screen below as we conclude the look at the journey that God has had the Apostle Paul on really for the last half of the book of Acts. Really, Acts chapter 13 starts that shift where the focus becomes more on what God was doing through Paul. And, and now we see an, yet another element of his story. We've already seen him in prison numerous times. We've seen him tried numerous times. We've seen him beaten. We've seen people try to kill him. And yet again today, we're going to see him in situations and circumstances that I don't think any of us would say, hey, that sounds like a lot of fun. I want to try that sometime. Acts chapter 27, we get started in verses 1 to 5 where we read these words. And when it was decided that we should sail for Italy, they delivered Paul and some other prisoners to a centurion of the Augustan cohort named Julius. And embarking in a ship of Ad Adramidium, which was about to sail to the ports along the coast of Asia, we put to sea accompanied by Aristarchus, a Macedonian from Thessalonica. The next day we put in at Sidon, and Julius treated Paul kindly and gave him leave to go to his friends and be cared for. And putting out to sea from there, we sailed under the lee of Cyprus because the winds were against us. And when we had sailed across the open sea along the coast of Cilicia and Pamphylia, we came to Myra in Lycia. Now, there's a lot of locations there. There's a lot of circumstances going on. If you're just joining us at Lakeside, we are so glad that you are here. What we have seen recently, as the book of Acts concludes, is that Paul has been giving a defense of his actions. They have said, we don't have enough evidence to, to put this man to death. We don't really even have enough evidence to keep him in prison, but because he was a Roman citizen and he demanded an appeal, they couldn't just release him before all those appeals were exhausted. And so that's what we saw last week as Acts chapter 26 concluded. And so we, set, we see the scene today that here is Paul. He's still in prison. He's with other prisoners and those overseeing the prisoners are treating Paul kindly. They give him leave to visit his friends. They're treating him well. And now we get some more background of what's going on. There the centurion found a ship of Alexandria, sailing for Italy, and put us on board. We sailed slowly for a number of days and arrived with difficulty off Nidus. And as the wind did not allow us to go farther, we sailed under the lee of Crete, of Salmone. Coasting along with difficulty, we came to a place called Fair Havens, near which was the city of Lycia. Since much time had passed, and the voyage was now dangerous because even the fast was already over, Paul advised them, saying, Sirs, I perceive that the voyage will be with injury and much loss, not only of the cargo and the ship, but also of our lives." Also of our lives. Now they're sailing to Italy, and we recognize even to this day that, that sailing can be dangerous. In certain circumstances, in certain situations, in certain conditions on the water, there's an element of danger even today with all the technological advances that we have, with all the ways that we have of building things better than were, than were previously available to people, we recognize there's still an element of danger today to being out on the open water. And this is without all of the technology and advancements that we have today, that they are sailing, and they're sailing in some really rough sailing conditions. Now, once September would hit, sailing conditions became incredibly dangerous. They became incredibly dangerous, and they would completely cease to sail from mid-November until late February. There would be, there would be no, no sailing from mid-November until late February just because of the conditions of the water. Now, the fast that's referenced here in verse, in verse number 9 is the, is the remembrance of the Day of Atonement. So, this, so we know that this fell either in late September or early October. So that's the time frame that we're looking at where the water is already dangerous. It's not to the point that nobody's going to do it, but all of a sudden the circumstances are incredibly difficult. And Paul 
says, wait a minute, this is not a good idea. We're going to be injured. This ship is going to be destroyed. And some of us are going to die. Some of us are going to die. That's what Paul told them. He said, the risk here, it, there's, this is a high-risk environment. This is a high-risk environment. And this, the result is not going to be good. And this isn't just apprehension from somebody who doesn't know what he's talking about. In Paul's second letter to the church in Corinth, in 2 Corinthians 11.25, Paul recounts that he'd been shipwrecked three times. So he knew exactly what he was talking about. And he says, hey, this is not a good idea. And some of you can relate to that. Because some of you are parents. And you see the decisions that your kids are going to make. And you know what they're about to do because you did them when you were younger. And you're like, that's not a good idea. And then there's that tension of how much leverage and leeway do we give our kids? Some of you can, can sympathize with this because you're employees. And the job that you've been instructed to do from the top, you recognize this is not the best way of going about doing this. And so you talk to your supervisor, you talk to management, you say, here's the inherent problem with what you've asked me to do. You see the risk. You can, you can put yourself in this situation where you see your circumstances, you see the situation around you, and you say, this, this isn't right. This isn't the best course of action. And that's what Paul did. And then verse 11 says, But the centurion paid more attention to the pilot and to the owner of the ship than to what Paul said. And because the harbor was not suitable to spend the winter in, the majority decided to put out to sea from there. On the chance that somehow they could reach Phoenix, a harbor of Crete, facing both southwest and northwest, and spend the winter there. So Paul speaks up, and he says, hey, just so you guys know, what we're about to do is not a good idea. There's inherent danger, and ultimately the centurion, he listens instead to the sailors, to the owner of the ship, to the captain. And he, he listens to what they say. And more, most people, most people wanted to risk it. Most people wanted to risk it. To play it safe would have been to do what Paul said to do. But most people wanted to risk it because where they were wasn't a great option for the winter. Where they were wasn't a great option for the winter. So rather than just stay there, they decided to do something that we're going to see unfolds in not a good direction. And this is just one of the things that we have to wrap our minds around. Because this is one of the things that can just paralyze us, or it can make us move in ways that come back to haunt us. And that is this. There are times in our lives we have to choose between two options, which neither one is a good option. Sometimes in life, we have to choose between lesser options. If we're faced with a choice, and one choice is, well, this could go horribly wrong, or this could be incredibly promising, that's not a hard choice to make. Every single one of us knows what to do. We don't, we don't have to sit around and mull it over. We should, but we don't even oftentimes pray about those things. We just say, well, it's obvious. This is the direction that I'm going to go. This is what I'm going to do. Frequently in life, those things don't, they don't harm us. They don't challenge us all that much because one is horrible, one is amazing. It's, it's, just the, it's, it's just the route that we're going to go. If you are faced on a road trip at an exit with two restaurant options and one of them literally, you know for a fact, has just been reopened that day because they failed numerous health inspections, and the other one, right next to them, has never gotten anything under the most superior marks that you can face. Their food is better, their service is better, and they're cheaper. Nobody is sitting at the intersection saying, oh, I don't know what to do. 
unless you just want to torture the people in the car with you. Nobody is going to the first option. And in life, sometimes we're faced with those choices. It's just obvious what we're going to do. But sometimes in life, we're faced with two options that neither one's that great. Which next to the restaurant that just opened today because they failed the food inspection is the restaurant that opened last week from failing a food inspection. And what can happen in those situations is because we want something else, we become paralyzed. We become unable to decide and unable to move. And sometimes it's not a bad thing. Sometimes it's not a bad thing that we, we enable ourselves to get more information, maybe think through different options. But sometimes in life, we just have to make a choice. And sometimes we're faced with two lesser options. And those can be the times that are damaging to us because those can be the times that we start to wonder, God, why are you mad at me? Or God, what did I do wrong? Because again, and, and very few of us would say this audibly, but if we're, if we're not careful, what we've allowed to creep into the theology of our lives is the mindset that if I go where God has called me to go, and if I do what God has called me to do, then he is going to bless me in such a way that my life is going to be easy, and I'm going to experience joy constantly, and hardship will be out of the equation. And the problem with that theology is it isn't found in Scripture anywhere. And I remind you again of the defense that Paul had just made in the chapters we've just looked where he talks about the radical transformation that God has made in his life, how he had abandoned his upbringing essentially to go to what God had called him to do and where God had called him to go. And what have we seen? Arrests, trials, imprisonments, beatings. And now he's on a ship. Or he tells them, this thing's going to be destroyed. People are going to die. Now when the south wind blew gently, supposing that they had obtained their purpose, they weighed anchor and sailed along Crete, close to the shore. But soon a tempestuous wind, called the Northeaster, struck down from the land. And when the ship was caught and could not face the wind, we gave way to it and were driven along, running under the lee of a small island called Cauda. We managed with difficulty to secure the ship's boat. After hoisting it up, they used supports to undergird the ship. Then fearing that they would run aground on the citrus, they lowered the gear, and thus they were driven along. Since we were violently storm-tossed, they began the next day to jettison the cargo. And on the third day, they threw the ship's tackle overboard with their own hands. When neither sun nor stars appeared for many days, and no small tempest lay on us, all hope of our being saved was at last abandoned. They're caught in a northeaster. The storm is now raging. They start throwing cargo overboard. They threw the tackle off the boat. The fear and the panic begins to set in. As everyone sees their life flashing before their eyes and everyone thinks they are going to die. And again, I ask, what is our response in those moments? What do we do? Since they had been without food for a long time, Paul stood up among them and said, Men, you should have listened to me and not have set sail from Crete and incurred this injury and loss. I, this, this might be one of my favorite verses in all of the Bible. 
Listen, every one of us who is married has heard these words. Every single one of us. We have heard these words when it just is spiraling out of control. When it is spiraling out of control. And some of us who are married have been lucky enough to get a chance to utter them at some point. Now, I'm just going to tell you, it doesn't always go over well in the moment. There is a little bit of a sick satisfaction there, but I'll let you deal with that. Hey, just to let you know, we do have a relationship series coming up starting in January. So we'll deal with all of that then, all right? So Merry Christmas. Get through Christmas still loving each other, and and then we'll work on it at this point in time. But Paul's just like, you should have listened to me. You should have listened to me. I told you. I told you this was going to happen. I told you we shouldn't have left. I told you this this would be our outcome. But he doesn't stop there. He doesn't stop there. Yet now I urge you to take heart. For there will be no loss of life among you, but only the ship. For this very night there stood before me an angel of the God to whom I belong and whom I worship. And he said, do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand before Caesar. And behold, God has granted you all those who sail with you. So take heart, men, for I have faith in God that it will be exactly as I have been told. But we must run aground on some island. Paul says, well, I told you so. But he doesn't stop there. And he tells the crew, take heart. He encourages them. There won't be a loss of life. And he relays to them God's message. He relays to them God's message. In the midst of times of uncertainty, in the midst where everything seems bleak, in those moments where your life flashes before your eyes, when you don't know where to turn and you don't know what to do, and fear is penetrating your heart and it is crippling you, and you look out and your future is uncertain and everything is spiraling out of control, then I am going to challenge you and I'm going to encourage you that you find hope in the very things that provided Paul's heart with hope. And he had an encounter with God, and that recentered him, and it refocused him, and he was then able to take that message to the people that he was around. So when you find yourself in that situation, and you will, make sure that Scripture is your ultimate guide. And here is Paul when everyone thinks the end is coming. And because of the message that God gave him, he told them to take heart. To take heart. Now here's the reality. We don't have the privilege of flying some 2,000-year-old Paul into Green Bay, picking him up, transporting him here to the stage, and having him share with us. The reason is because Paul, like all of us, was human. And so while God would spare him here, ultimately there would come a point where he would live out the verse that he wrote. To live is Christ and to die is gain. And he would live and experience the hope that he wrote about under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. That to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Every single one of us will face that day. And yet we can take heart. Because the hope and the promise that we have from God is not that we will live forever, but that He has offered us a life that is everlasting through the work of His Son, Jesus. The very message that Paul would take to all the different regions and spend his life devoted to sharing with others. This is our hope. So when the prognosis comes, when the uncertainty comes, 
When the moment where we see the headlights heading for us and we aren't going to escape it comes, we have hope and our hope is found in Jesus and the hope that he offers us that he has conquered our sin, he has conquered death, he is greater than the grave and he offers us life everlasting with our creator. When the 14th night had come, as we were being driven across the Adriatic Sea, about midnight the sailors suspected that they were nearing land, so they took a sounding and found 20 fathoms. A little farther on, they took a sounding again and found 15 fathoms, and fearing that we might run on the rocks, they let down four anchors from the stern and prayed for day to come. And as the sailors were seeking to escape from the ship and had lowered the ship's boat into the sea under pretense of laying out anchors from the bow, Paul said to the centurion and the soldiers, unless these men stay in the ship, you cannot be saved. Then the soldiers cut away the ropes of the ship's boat and let it go. The ship's coming closer to land, and the sailors are nervous. They're going to wreck. They're trying to, they're trying to run out. Paul knows what's going on. He reports that the sailors cut away. They cut away the rescue boat. As the day was about to dawn, Paul urged them all to take some food, saying, today is the 14th day that you have continued in suspense and without food, having taken nothing. Therefore, I urge you to take some food, for it will give you strength, for not a hair is to perish from the head of any of you. And when he had said these things, he took bread and giving thanks to God in the presence of all, he broke it and began to eat. Then they all were encouraged and ate some food themselves. We were in all 276 persons in the ship. And when they had eaten enough, they lightened the ship throwing out the wheat into the sea. This is a two-week ordeal. So fearful. that They didn't eat. Paul prays. He eats in the, in the midst of people who had been too nervous to do the same, and now they're willing to do the same. And they throw wheat into the sea. Now, when it was day, they did not recognize the land, but they noticed a bay with a beach on which they planned, if possible, to run the ship ashore. So they cast off the anchors and left them in the sea, at the same time loosening the ropes that tied the rudders, then hoisting the foresail to the wind they made for the beach. But striking a reef, they ran the vessel aground. The bow stuck and remained immovable, and the stern was being broken up by the surf. The soldiers' plan was to kill the prisoners, lest any should swim away and escape. The boat is run aground. The soldiers decide, well, here's one solution. Let's just kill them all. That way none of them can escape. But the centurion, wishing to save Paul, kept them from carrying out their plan. He ordered those who could swim to jump overboard first and make for the land, and the rest on planks or on pieces of the ship. And so it was that all were brought safely to land. Now, why do we talk about this? Other than it's fascinating and shipwrecks are are kind of cool to talk about, and it gives us some historical perspective. But, but why, do we talk about, why do we talk about this, and how does this help us in our lives? And here's the question that I want you to wrestle with. As we've just seen that some of the soldiers, are, they're pragmatic. And as the shipwreck is happening, they're thinking, well, these people were in prison for a reason, and we don't want any of them to escape. And the way that we can make sure they don't escape is just to kill them. So let's just, let's just take care of them. And what does the centurion do? The centurion leverages his position to show mercy, to lead well, so that lives are saved. And the question that all of us can wrestle with, whether God has placed us in law enforcement or the business sector, health care, education. 
the question that all of us have to wrestle with is this. How are we leveraging the position that God has placed us in? How are we leveraging the position that God has placed us in? Are we using our position to better the lives of people around us? Are we using our position to lead well? Even if it isn't the most popular decision. What are we doing with the platforms that God has given us? And you might think to yourself, well, I don't, I don't really have much of a platform. I would tell you, you are dead wrong. If you're a parent, you have a platform. If you work with people on your team, you have a platform. If you're on the internet, you have a platform. Everyone today has a platform. Everyone. And the question that all of us has to answer is, how are we leveraging the platforms that God has given us, that he's entrusted to us, and are we leveraging them for him? Are we bettering the people that we serve and work beside? Are we parenting well? Are we pointing our kids to Jesus? Do our coworkers know that when their lives are spiraling out of control, there's something about us, and maybe they can't even put their finger on it, but they just know there is something different about you. Because the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And in a world that is lacking all of those things, are we leveraging them? It doesn't mean that we have to preach the gospel audibly every single day with the words that we say. But how are we leveraging our lives? Through the choices and the decisions that we make to ultimately point people to the hope of Jesus. And sometimes that's going to call for us to take the lead. And sometimes we're going to have to look at things and say, you know what? That's not right. And sometimes in a world that's becoming increasingly post-Christian, sometimes the majority, or maybe even most of the time, isn't going to listen and isn't going to respond in the way that we hope they would respond. And the question that gets thrown back to us is how do we respond when they've responded in a way that we hoped they wouldn't respond? Now we saw from Paul. He got in a little, I told you so. But the problem is when that's all that we say. When that's all that we say and we don't follow up with the words and the actions that he followed that with. That's where the trouble comes. Because we're seen as arrogant. We're seen as uncaring. We're seen as distant. We're seen as unloving. May we, as people that love and follow Jesus, leverage the platforms that he has given us to better the lives of all that we come into contact with. And constantly, through our words and our deeds, point people to Jesus. And when they don't respond, in the way that we hope they would respond. May we then 
still lovingly tried to redirect them back to the hope that Christ provides in the way we saw Paul did. And when we live with eternity in mind and the hope that is set before us through the work of our Savior, then what we recognize is the opinions that everyone has of me today are not ultimately what define me. And they are not ultimately the thing that is most important to me. But ultimately, I serve Him. And that will bless me more than I can ever fathom and ever imagine but it's also going to take me to some challenging places. And to some circumstances and situations I'd rather not face. And I'd rather not deal with. But ultimately, my hope (coughs) is found in Jesus. And that is what carries me through the good times. And the bad. God, I pray that our hope be found in you. I pray for the person right now, God, who's struggling. Fear is trying its best to creep into their world. And it's succeeding. And the uncertainty of tomorrow. Has drowned out any other hope it seems. And I pray, God, that your spirit would be louder. I pray that the hope that you offer drown out the fear. I pray that we would use our platforms for your glory, Jesus. Shape us first. use us in powerful ways and may the hope that can only be found in a relationship with you spread across this region and God we pray that you'd use us to be part of that hope spreading message transform us first empower us equip us May we glorify you. It's all for you, Jesus. It's in your name that we pray. Amen.